Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to one of the Making More From Sheep uh, webinar uh, webinars of the Making More From Sheep webinar series. Now, tonight's webinar is going to be on the cost-effective sheep vaccination programs. And luckily tonight we have um, Bruce Allworth presenting and he is also supported by Matt Playford. Now, we haven't got any other webinars planned just at the moment, but we've been advised by MLA that we probably have um, have some room to move on a few more. So we're going to be putting our heads down over the next few days and pulling together another few webinars for the audience tonight. And I'll be able to let you all know by email very soon what those topics and dates will be. So just moving on to the webinar platform, uh, there's for those who haven't attended a webinar yet, you'll see a control panel like this depicted on your screen now. It'll be up in the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, you can hear us, but we can't actually hear you. That red arrow on the left hand side of the control panel collapses and re-estates it so you can see your full screen. And the question box down below, that's an important part of the evening. When you've got your questions, um, please, write them in that questions box and hit send. They come through in a log chronologically at my end and at the end of the webinar, we're gonna go through with uh, Bruce Allworth, the presenter, and Matt Playford, the, the um, uh, technical expert in, in uh, vaccination of uh, va sheep vaccination programs, and we'll get those questions answered. So just quickly moving on to the Making More From Sheep program. Tonight's webinar falls underneath the uh, module sheep health module 11 so this making more from sheep resources is a, is a great tool for producers jump online have a look it's full of uh, good information tools and links to other areas so our presenter tonight is bruce allworth so bruce graduated from vet science at sydney university in 1984 and after that he worked at massey university in new zealand Bruce has worked on projects such as the McKinnon Project and he's also owned and operated his own sheep and beef cattle consultancy based in southern New South Wales and Victoria for the last 25 years. Uh, currently Associate Professor of Ruminant Health and Production at Walgers Charles Sturt University. Uh, Bruce is operating his own family farm at Holbrook with approximately 10,000 sheep and 900 Angus cattle. And he's going to be very well equipped to present tonight's webinar on cost-effective sheep vaccination programs. Supporting Bruce is uh, Matt Playford. Matt Playford is the Director of um, uh, Animal Health uh, or, uh, yes, an Animal Health uh, Organisation, Dorbutts, and is also a key advisor to um, Zoetis Australia um, Animal Health uh, Product Provider. So Matt has kindly come on board and he'll be attending the Q&A session at the end of the webinar and uh, making sure that all the technical questions surrounding vaccinations and vaccination programs are answered uh, as well as they can be this evening. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Bruce to the webinar. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thanks, David, and welcome to everyone. I see we've got uh, 85 attendees uh, at the moment and uh, rising. The um, our budget must have been very interesting, David. We, we, we must be a bigger draw card than the budget. Okay, um, we're, what I'm going to um, talk about tonight is um, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the cost effectiveness of vaccination. I'm not going to concentrate so much on actually how you vaccinate. Um, and um, the other good thing is that we've got Matt Playford um, on board and he's representing Zoetis. Um, and I would encourage anyone, if they have any questions about vaccination, uh, the companies really have all the information um, about correct vaccination programs and how well the vaccines will work. Uh, they actually have more information than the rest of us because some of the information um, is not published. Um, so it's terrific having um, Matt on this evening. Um, I'm going to have a look at the break-even points for various vaccines. Uh, at the moment, you'll see this is all fairly um, easy at the moment. And I'm going to go through the vaccinations one by one, and then there'll be plenty of opportunity to address any questions to Matt or myself 
uh, or any general questions, um, I'm sure Matt will make some comments. Um, there is also, um, David mentioned the um, making more from sheep. On the MLA website, there is an MA, uh, an MLA health cost calculator um, that I've just put the um, link there to. It's actually designed for cattle, but you can pretend you've got a thousand cattle instead of ten cattle, and it will uh, help you work out um, the cost of uh, cost of effectiveness of vaccination. During the presentation, I'll use some um, boxes and some oval. The boxes will have the break-even points on it for each vaccination, and the ovals will have some key points. Just some, some very basic things about um, vaccination, uh, which apologies to most of you, because I'm sure you all know them, but they are very important for what we're talking about this evening. The, the first and most important thing is that vaccines are not 100% protective. They will usually be around about 90% effective or 95% uh, effective, um, but it's almost impossible to say how effective a vaccine will be because it does depend on the level of challenge. And it's a little bit like the push bike rider on the screen there with the helmet on. The helmet will offer protection and it can be a very high level of protection. So if that person falls off the push bike, um, has a just a normal um, just loses balance and falls off um, and hits their head. The um, helmet's likely be very to be very effective. However, if the person unfortunately runs into a semi trailer, I suspect the protection of the helmet will have little to do with um, the the outcome of the event. So it's just something to remember that the protection that's afforded will depend on the challenge. The higher the challenge that is faced. Um, the more vaccines will be found wanting, the lower the challenge, the better the vaccines will look uh, for a given vaccine. The other thing is that vaccines contain antigenic components. Uh, they used to mostly be whole cell, but these days they're more specific proteins um, that mimic or are similar to the antigenic response that occurs when disease happens. Uh, it's important to remember that that without those proteins, the animal won't respond to the vaccine. And so if we see down the bottom, it's very important that you do treat vaccines properly. If the protein denatures by being overheated or, or long-term exposed to light, the vaccine won't be effective. So proper treatment of vaccines is important. And vaccines end up creating a challenge, often similar to the disease, um, but without causing disease, or in, in the case of scabby mouth, they actually do cause scabby mouth, but it's in a region that doesn't matter. And most of the vaccines we're going to talk about work on antibody uh, protection, but there is a second form of immunity that occurs uh, in both ourselves and in animals called cell, media, cell mediated immunity, and that's important with the OJD or uh, Gadir vaccine. Um, and just a reminder that uh, there's a graph down the bottom here indicating that most vaccines will need two responses. The first will need two doses. The first dose is a sensitising dose um, and you get a short response. The animal may be, um, provide sufficient antibodies to be protected for a very short period of time, a couple of weeks. Sometimes that first response doesn't even get up to this uh, dark protective line I've drawn across there. And then when you give the second vaccination, usually four to six weeks after the first vaccine, um, or, or later than that, but at least four weeks after the first vaccine, you get a much greater response and it's a prolonged response. And that's what we're generally uh, talking about for most of the vaccines. Um, the, the main Question um, as a producer is, so do I need to vaccinate? And obviously the other question is, what do I need to vaccinate my sheep against? Uh, which I'll cover in a minute. In terms of whether or not you need to vaccinate, we look at the cost of the vaccine. And most vaccines at the moment are extraordinarily cheap compared with the consequences of the, of the outcome. This hasn't always been the case. I think the, the price of vaccines now is similar to what it was 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and fortunately, the price of sheep has moved up uh, quite considerably. Um, we also need to consider the impact of the disease uh, with the clostridials. It's usually sudden death and there's not much you can do about it. 
Um, with Campylobacter, uh, we're looking at loss of uh, lambs with arthritis. Um, with Eribac, we're looking at arthritis. It's an arthritis vaccine, but essentially that's similar to the loss of lambs because these days arthritic lambs can't be uh, sold, so they're essentially uh, unsaleable. We also need to look at the likelihood of disease, and this is the most important thing to consider in your own farm as to how likely a disease is, whether it's going to occur rarely or frequently or just occasionally. And the likelihood of disease will depend on the type of challenge. If you're, for instance, grazing um, highly nutritious pastures, you're in a high rainfall area, um, you've got a lot of clover or loosen, uh, that will place extra um, pressure on the animals um, and make them more likely to have problems such as um, pulpy kidney. Um, the other thing we can consider is the attitude to losses. Uh, some people are happy um, to accept losses uh, if they've decided that they occur rarely and that rare event occurs. Um, other people, even if the rare event occurs, um, consider that unacceptable. So that influences whether or not to use vaccination. And something that I guess we probably wouldn't have considered five or ten years ago, but is certainly in the in the um, uh, considerations these days is the welfare aspects and the question is whether it's acceptable to allow losses for a preventable disease, i.e. one that you can vaccinate against. Um, the, other, the other question, um, and I'd welcome any questions on this, and I'm sure Matt will make a comment at the end, but how long do vaccines last um, and how effective are vaccines? Now I've talked about the effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, just slipping down to that, just to remind you that the protection does depend on um, the antibody response for most vaccines, and that will vary from animal to animal. Not every animal will be identical. It will depend on the degree of challenge. And the other thing which is very hard to assess is if you have a low-level challenge that's ongoing and you've already vaccinated animals, that might lead to the vaccine appearing to last a lot longer um, because of continual stimulation of the immune system by that ongoing challenge. Um, that can occur with some diseases, probably isn't such an issue with the clostridial diseases. Um, most vaccines um, have very specific label claims for how long the vaccine lasts and when you need to reboost, and that's probably the best information we've got, albeit to say, um, some of the vaccines have been registered for a long period of time. The information required in those days um, for registration wasn't as rigorous as it is now, and it certainly hasn't been in the uh, company's interest, the vaccine companies, to go out and show that vaccines last a lot longer than they originally thought. So I guess there hasn't been as much um, work done on those things. Um, but generally, um, if the a company suggests a vaccine will last for 12 months, it will last for 12 months. It may last longer depending on the challenge and the ongoing uh, level of challenge. But the important point is that if two doses are required, as I showed in that earlier graph, the first vaccination gives little or no protection and you really only get protection about seven days after you give the second vaccination and then you've got fairly solid immunity. Um, sorry, I've just clicked over. This this table um, is probably the critical table for this presentation. What I've got on the left-hand side um, in the dark blue are the vaccines that are available for sheep uh, in Australia. Um, as far as I'm aware, Matt might be able to add one or two in there. Um, and I'll be talking about um, I won't. I'll be talking about the uh, the top ones and I won't be talking much about the bottom ones. Uh, I'll make a couple of uh, comments on Barbavax but I haven't had much to do with that um, and I'm happy to answer questions on foot rot. I know little or nothing about botulism and anthrax is a, um, you need CBO approval and is a very specific uh, vaccine. So I won't take um, time with the whole group spending uh, time on those but if you have any questions by all means ask. Um, and I will go through these um, various, uh, the, the top ones, one by one. Um, this table is just an easy ready rector. If you go back to um, look at this presentation, you'll see the um, various uh, requirements for each of these and the cost of the vaccination 
and also the break-even points, which I'll mention as I go through each um, disease. So if we need to, we can come back to that table, um, but I think it's all covered in the subsequent um, uh, slides, and I'll explain how I've developed the break-even point. So if we just look at the clostridials, um, the clostridial vaccinations, sorry, if I just go back there, we've got essentially these um, first uh, three vaccinations up primarily targeted against clostridial diseases, um, the classic five-in-one. There is actually, and I haven't listed on here, there is a three-in-one, um, but given the cost and everything, most people would use it as the very basic five-in-one vaccination. The six-in-one adds in cheesy gland. It used to be a bit of an issue whether you should be using six-in-one or five-in-one, but if you look at these approximate costs, it really costs very little or nothing to add in cheesy gland. Um, so I think that's just something that you'd do if you've got sheep, you'd be using six in one. The other one that is available is a Tazvax eight in one, which claims um, much uh, longer protection for pulpic kidney and also has three extra antigens in it, all clostridial. The important thing about eight in one is it does not cover cheesy gland. So it's not six in one plus two, it's five in one plus three. Um, and covers a couple of diseases which are, are relatively um, rare to my knowledge. Um, so looking specifically at the clostridials, the main clostridial disease for most producers, particularly given the number of prime lambs around now, is pulpy kidney. It occurs in rapidly growing rat lambs on good feed um, or also when you're growing feeding animals and it's also associated with a change of feed. The problem with pulpy kidney is you get little or no warning, uh, the animal's dead and there's really nothing you can do. If it's not vaccinated, um, then there's little you can do. Uh, black disease, uh, I just mentioned the main thing with black disease is if you have liver fluke on your place, then coverage for black disease will be very important. If you don't have liver fluke, uh, black disease is much less important except in rams. Um, where they can get the same organism that causes the liver problem also uh, causes swelled head and rams. Uh, black leg is also covered in the five in one, six in one and eight in ones. Um, my experience is it's very unusual um, in sheep compared with cattle, so it's probably not an important one. Um, and tetanus is uh, something that we see associated with um, marking wounds usually, and usually in dusty yards or associated with um, poor hygiene. The important thing about um, tetanus and also some cases of pulpy kidney, those that occur about six to eight weeks when the lambs are suddenly moving on to eating grass from drinking milk, is that you need to have covered the ewes pre-lambing to um, get them protected prior to or at lamb marking time. Um, the final one is malignant edema. That brings up our five in five in one associated with wound sites and also ewes um, over lambing. Um, period. Um, and what the, the current with the current price of sheep, if you suffered 0.6% of losses, or that six sheep in every thousand, or one um, 60 percent of a sheep in every hundred, so it, it's um, sort of, um, uh, yeah, three sheep in 500 is as close as we can get to um, real sheep, um, three sheep in 500 or six sheep in a thousand. Um, then if the vaccine was 95% effective um, and you valued those lambs that you were losing at $100, you would have paid for the vaccine at around the 25 to 30, 30 cent mark. I've, I've listed the cost of the vaccines um, on that original um, chart I showed you. When I've done the analysis, I've added in 10 or 20 cents for um, uh, labour, it's a moot point and you really have to do your own sums on that. For some people, um, the labour's already there and you would have been doing something else with that labour. It's not a saving by not vaccinating, it's just an extra job. For other people, um, they need to add labour cost in, so it depends on your system. But I have covered a small amount, uh, albeit not particularly generous um, when I've done the analysis. Um, and the other one that's in usually that we would now almost use as standard is using six in one, including cheesy gland. Cheesy gland um, is spread most commonly post shearing when animals are in close contact, either via the shearing cuts or respiratory. 
it is a problem if they get lung um, uh, lesions and also you find the odd lesion in a ram which is um, a nuisance because they're usually scrotal, scrotal uh, lesions which would lead to the culling of the ram which is quite a loss and it does uh, lose carcass trimming. When this vaccine first came out there was quite a difference between five in one and six in one in terms of the price. In fact it went from about 20 cents from memory to about 65 cents or 60 cents. It used to be about 35 cents to vaccinate for cheesy gland. It's now two or three cents, five cents, up to 10 cents if you're getting one of the cheaper ones compared with um, six in one. But still that's extremely cheap and I would be using six in one in preference to five in one whenever I was vaccinating with sheep. Um, if you want to vaccinate for cheesy gland alone, um, then it becomes a bit more of a, a challenge doing the sums but the value you're getting in, in um, the lambs from the five in one more than pays for it. So I don't think that's a big issue. Um, if we move on to scabby mouth and I'm just trying to touch on all the important ones before we get to the question time. Um, it's uh, unlike all the other, almost all the other vaccinations, it's a single vaccination because it's actually a live vaccination. If you are vaccinating with scabby mouth you've got to remember that you don't want disinfectant or anything actually near what you're doing because that would deactivate the vaccine. The other thing that is important is scabby mouth is a zoonosis. That means that you or your children or your wife, uh, if they handle animals that have been vaccinated or animals with scabby mouth, they could get a nasty lesion if they have a cut or break in the skin and they come into contact with the virus. Um, so you do need to treat it all fairly carefully. Um, you generally get mouth lesions with scabby mouth, but you can also get feet lesions. Um, it's not a, a major disease, but it occurs often just when you're trying to sell lambs um, and they can't be sent, sent into market um, and they start to lose weight. It usually only um, is present for two to three weeks. Most animals will, will recover very quickly, but if that's just as you're trying to finish lambs, it can be a nuisance. Uh, it, the vaccine is given by a scratch inside the leg. The animals get the disease. You then have to be careful. The sort of the sort of thing that happens is you, you scratch a lamb inside the leg. The lamb happens to have got damaged at landmarking or as a crook lamb, you decide to pick it up and take it back on the bike back to the paddock or one of your kids hops in and picks up the lamb because it's not looking very happy and they've grabbed the lamb just where you put the vaccine. So it just um, encourage that. The virus uh, does live in the soil. I don't know how long for it's, it's been reported up to 10 years. I actually haven't seen that um, in, in research work, but it, it does live for a long time in the soil. It means that if you vaccinate because you're actually using live virus, you are introducing the virus. But my understanding is that most farms, um, certainly in the high rainfall areas, would have it. If you got a 3% prevalence of um, scabby mouth, um, and you only allowed a $10 loss for those lambs getting it and the vaccine was 95% effective, it would have paid for itself. So again, if you ever have any problems with scabby mouth, a 3% prevalence of scabby mouth in an outbreak situation would be a very low prevalence indeed. Often, if you've got the right conditions, you'll get 20 or 30% of animals to be affected and it really is very off-putting. So scabby mouth is well worthwhile thinking about. Um, but remember, it's just the one shot and it is something that you can catch. Um, if we look at uh, Gadare, um, the OJD vaccine, it is also a single vaccination. Now, it is recommended to be given to animals between the ages of 4 to 16 weeks. Now, that 4 to 16 weeks applies to infected properties. It doesn't mean you can't vaccinate animals that don't have the disease and you're buying onto your farm at an older age. But if you have OJD in your flock or you think you have it in your flock and you're trying to use vaccination to minimise losses from OJD, you need to get the vaccine into those animals. Um, certainly the earlier the better, six to eight weeks is ideal and certainly before 14 to 16 weeks. If you're later than that, the vaccine will still work on those animals that haven't been exposed to OJD, but those animals that have already been exposed to OJD at, at um, six weeks or eight weeks or even one week of age, um, the vaccine, if you get it nice and early, the vaccine tends to be a little bit curative in the first three or four weeks, 
but the older the animal gets, the less likely the vaccine uh, can do anything than prevent it getting infected. And once an animal's infected, then um, the vaccine's not going to be effective. Um, I've just highlight, but I'm not going to talk about the whole sem webinar in itself, but you really need to be careful when you're vaccinating with um, uh, Gadare and you need to use, there's an a excellent applicator now you can use that um, will stop needle injury and using short needles. Um, and when somebody saw me running this webinar, they rang me straight away and said, make sure I tell you all about it, but that's not actually the point of the webinar. Um, but happy to answer questions on it. Should you vaccinate with um, uh, Gadare? In terms of the break even, if you assume that the sheep you're uh, losing are $100 and you assume the vaccine is 90% effective, then if you can prevent 2.5% of losses annually, you've paid for the vaccine. It's quite complicated doing it because it's a, a single shot that you get for, for life uh, that you give your sheep, it costs $2.25 plus the labour to, to do it, um, but most Farms that have OJD uh, present on them, uh, once, the, once it's been present for five to six years, most farms would experience losses between five and 15%. So vaccine is certainly worthwhile if OJD is present. So should you vaccinate? Yes, if OJD is present. Uh, I'd probably say if OJD is likely to be present, or if you're in a, an area where OJD is very common, you don't know it's in your flock, but you suspect it could be, well then, then um, it's probably worthwhile using OJD vaccine. For some people, vaccinating their animals that they're going to sell even though they don't have it uh, gives them greater market access to properties that want to buy vaccinated animals um, because they're being introduced into an infected mob. Um, and if you are introducing animals onto your place, you might consider vaccine, vaccinating them if they've come from a free area, no point at all in vaccinating them if, um, if they've come from an infected flock um, once they're over 16 weeks of age. But if they're going to be on your place longer than two years, there is absolutely no point in vaccinating any animal with, uh, with Gadea that uh, does not, that is going to be killed or uh, you're not in control of and you don't want it for a market access reason if you're not going to have them for more than two years. The, the, the disease, um, the animals get the disease usually when they're young, but they don't show it up till they're at least 18 months to two years of age. And the older an animal is when it gets exposed to OJD, the longer it's likely for that period to be. So if you're buying in three-year-old ewes and you're ditching them as five-year-old cast-for-age ewes, you're not going to get much value, if any, out of a, a Gadir vaccine, even if they're going on to an infected flock. But if you're buying one and a half year old ewes, planning to keep them for four years, uh, you're in an area with OJD and you think they've come from an area that hasn't uh, had OJD, it'll be well worthwhile vaccinating them. I hope I've um, made that um, clear. So, um, and I guess the important thing about OJD, as you all know, is it's a slow, very insidious disease. Okay, we're on to the last or second last, um, the second last one I'm going to talk about. So I'm almost finished there, David. I can see he's getting a bit anxious. Um, Erivac is a vaccine I haven't had much experience with, um, and Matt might be able to make comments. Um, er it's against uh, erysipelas, Thrix um, is the bacteria that it's against, which causes arthritis in lambs. But the important thing is there are lots of causes of arthritis. Uh, chlamydia is a very common one, and if you've got arthritis due to chlamydia, uh, Erivac uh, won't uh, overcome your arthritis uh, problems. Um, so it will help if you've got uh, erysipelas as the cause of arthritis, but not for other causes. Um, and to get protection, you need to give use two doses pre-lambing if they haven't been um, uh, dosed previously, um, because you need protection uh, prior to you. Um, the lambs often get arthritis with their erysipelas prior to um, marking or around marking, so you need the pre-lambing booster. The break-even point is if you've got a 1.2% prevalence for um, arthritis in your flock associated with erysipelas, um, then uh, uh, allowing for giving a pre-lambing booster each year, which averages 1.26, you'll just have to believe me, averages 1.26 doses, um, a year uh, for each ewe, 
if the vaccine is 90% effective and you um, calculate $80 for your losses, um, if lambs get arthritis, um, why didn't I do 100, just uh, slightly different um, numbers, um, the prevalence, the break-even point is 1.2% uh, prevalence. And the final um, uh, one I'm just going to uh, talk about is Campylobacter. There's an Ovilus uh, campy vac uh, vaccine that Coopers have um, put out. Uh, it's been around for about four or five years, but it's only recently just been registered for um, general use uh, in sheep. And I actually gave these slides in uh, the last webinar I gave. Um, so I'll just uh, flick over these, but the most important thing is that Campylobacter causes abortion. It is not the only cause of abortion. Uh, Toxo is probably the next most common cause. Um, it is associated with very heavy stocking rates, such as mob uh, stocking or hand feeding in dry autumns and winter. Um, it lives in the, the sheep intestinal tracts, um, and it's, the vaccine is available. You need to give two doses um, around joining time, either prior to joining um, or one dose before joining and one dose after joining. So the maidens uh, would cost $2.20 to vaccinate. We actually did a trial uh, about uh, five years ago looking on farms vaccinating um, young sheep and not vaccinating, vaccinating and comparing what happened. One of those six properties, we got a, an effect on lamb survival. The Kiwis claim that on flocks that they're not aware that they have Campylobacter abortion, i.e. they don't have abortion storms. The Kiwis claim they get a 10% increase in lamb marking percentage by using the vaccine. So that was the genesis for doing this trial. Uh, we found on one of the six places that that was certainly true, but uh, on five of the six places we got little or no uh, benefit from the vaccine. Um, although it was a particularly good year and the challenge would have been pretty low. Um, the break-even point for this one is if you're getting a 3% prevalence, um, then that would be the case. Or if you only vaccinated your maidens, which are the highest risk um, to having Campylobacter problems, uh, and you um, were able to increase um, or, or stop a 5% lamb loss, then it would be break-even. So if the Kiwis um, are right and you get a 10% um, increase in lambs, then it's well worthwhile. If um, your lambing percentage isn't being affected, as we saw in some of those trials, then it wouldn't be cost effective. Um, so I think that basically brings um, to the end. I've just got two very brief slides. Uh, just a mention on pre-lambing vaccination, and Matt might want to add some things on this, but uh, most um, most, pack, most um, information on the packet says, um, you know, four to six weeks before um, lambing, you should do your pre-lambing vaccination. Some work in Scotland about 30 years ago actually showed that uh, if you vaccinated those lambs anywhere in the six months prior to lambing, that the antibody levels in the colostrum were similar, or uh, they were actually in the trial they did slightly higher the earlier they vaccinated. Um, so you don't need to wait right until the point of lambing. Of course, quite a few producers drench their ewes coming up to lambing and that value, the closer you are to lambing, the more value you're going to get out of the drench, um, particularly if you're using shorter acting drenches and that's often combined with um, pre-lamb vaccination. My problem with pre-lamb vaccination is simply uh, putting sheep into wet muddy yards on the point of lambing uh, is asking for a foot abscess problem and unfortunately we don't have a foot abscess vaccination um, or I'd be talking about that. Um, I've mentioned we need the pre-lambing dose for pulpy kidney and tetanus. Um, I won't mention the scabby mouth example here other than to say that um, uh, it was just an example that shows that vaccine does wane, wane over time even though we say it's a, um, a, a lifetime immunity. I've talked about the operator care with Gadare and scabby mouth and the importance of keeping vaccine, um, looking after your vaccine, not tr throwing it in the back of the ute and, and then um, going out and vaccinating the animals six hours later with it sitting out in the back of the ute. I think most producers are certainly on top of that. So in summary, at the moment, most vaccines for sheep are very cheap. Um, and six in one uh, should be given, in my view, in most, if not all, flocks, particularly in high rainfall areas. Um, Gadare is a very useful um, product. Um, if you've got OJD, it's a must, um, but it does depend on your area. Um, I think producers should be thinking more about the Campylobacter vaccine, Campivax, 
um, and Erivac is there if erysipelas is the problem. But the main issue with arthritis is to find out what's causing the arthritis. If you've um, if the vaccine requires two doses, give two doses. Giving one is is how to waste your money. Um, give two doses if you're going to give one. Um, and always think about operator and vaccine safety. Okay, sorry, I've actually gone over for a couple of minutes there. My apologies, David. No, that's fine, Bruce. And no worries at all. Thank you for a very comprehensive overview of the topic area. It's a big topic area. Uh, I wish I had uh, watched this webinar some years ago in my youth and then experience I managed to vaccinate myself against scabby mouth. And um, <laughs> you think I need to do it again? I might. I might <laughs> my view might be waning. That's right. <laughs> um, look, thank you very much. I'll give you a break there for a little bit, Bruce. I just want to remind everyone about the post-webinar survey. Now, that's going to pop up after the webinar. Just take your take a bit of time to put your thoughts down there. Um, you're welcome to provide constructive uh, feedback, uh, co uh, you know, comments of praise or recommendations for future, future webinars, all the, all the above. Now, there's been a um, there's been a bit of a, a shuffle uh, in the uh, in the webinar ranks. Now, we're we're thinking that this would be the last webinar of the series. We're hoping to run another couple of webinars. Like I said at the start of the presentation, we'll be in touch with you via email about when those webinars are to be held and what those topic areas are. So keep an eye on your emails, and I'll update you as soon as I can. Now, I might just introduce Matt Playford to the webinar. Are you with us there, Matt? Yeah, good day, Dave. How are you going? Welcome to the webinar and thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks very much. Um, Pleasure. Now, uh, Matt and Bruce, I've got a, a fair few questions rolling in here. Now... Um, I, I just think, David, before we have questions, did Matt want to add anything or correct anything I said or just make any specific comments or we go straight on to the um, questions? Matt? Um, Bruce, I've, I've just got one, one comment. You've, you've given us a very thorough overview of all the different vaccines available for sheep, um, but I just wanted to remind um, everyone that if you want to find out more, the best place to look is on the label, and you've got a couple of options here. You can actually go into a store and pull out the inserts and read through. If you want to do it in the comfort of your own home, go to a website called PubCris. That's P-U-B-C-R-I-S. It's run by the APVMA, and that's got the label for every single registered product, including all of these sheep vaccines. A great way to, to look through and catch up on all the details, especially the label claims for each vaccine. Yeah, excellent point, Matt. And I hope every everyone understood that that was pub Chris and not not to go to the pub to look up the information. But that's an excellent point. Over to you, David. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, Bruce. Thank you for that. And Matt, if you um, have any more input there, just jump on in now. As it, like I said, there's a fair few questions coming through. I suspect um, maybe the first one here. Uh, it, it could be suited to you, Matt. Now, if not, I'm, I'm going to try and share these questions as best I can. Uh, for the audience, if you have a question specific to either uh, Bruce Allworth or Matt Playford this evening, please make a note of that at the front of your question so I know who to direct the question to specifically. If not, I'll do my best to um, direct the questions to the most appropriate um, uh, the most appropriate deliverer. But if uh, Bruce or Matt, if you think one or the other would be better off answering the question, well, please just say so and we can make that happen. Uh, the first question I've got here, it may be suited to you, Matt, and to give Bruce a bit more of a break. Matt, Philip asks, have you, uh, I have been using Erivac for a number of years with excellent results. Um, Will there be a time when I no longer have to vaccinate for arthritis? We don't see any physical signs of arthritis. However, a recent abattoir surveillance on old and dry ewes showed up 10% arthritis. Yeah, good question, um, Philip. It's something that we, we haven't really um, got much research results on, but um, listening to producers like yourself talking, there always seems to be a bit of um, erysipelas around. Now, it may, it may be because 
It's in the pig population and it's continually spread um, in and around um, anywhere where there's uh, feral pigs or even domestic pigs. And it seems to get into the sheep and spread amongst them as well. So there, there doesn't seem to be a situation where you can ever just say, no, I'm not going to ever have uh, erysipelas again. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Bruce, I've got this question earmarked for you. Um, Cameron, uh, Cameron's from down towards uh, Pleasant Hills. Cameron asks, why can't we get foot rot vaccines? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Why can't we get foot rot vaccine? We haven't got all night to answer it. Um, the, there was a foot rot vaccine available um, that had relatively short immunity for, in merinos for about six to eight weeks and, and about 12 weeks in, in um, uh, not merino sheep. Um, that uh, got taken off after the um, equine flu um, issue when everything was uh, all biosecurity was uh, revised and the companies haven't um, gone for re-registration of that product. There is currently a, um, it's just been registered, the, um, the work that's been done at Sydney University using um, vaccines where you work out which serogroup is present for the foot rot and then up to two um, serogroups are included in a specific vaccine made for your flock um, and that vaccine is available. The, the other exciting thing with foot rot is that um, there is some excellent research going on at the moment between Monash University and Sydney University looking at a new vaccine for foot rot which um, doesn't rely on the serogroups and would, be, um, would really be a major breakthrough um, as it's likely to target all forms of foot rot. But given it's a vaccine, given that it's um, only still being developed, um, we're talking five to ten years before that will be available. So if we're all still there, we can enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Matt, there's a question here uh, that your experience with the um, gastrointestinal parasites will, will help you answer. Uh, Chris asks, with the number of treatments necessary for Barbavax uh, programs, isn't it easier to just worm test regularly and then drench when required? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting um, question and something that a lot of producers are starting to ask now, not just in the New England, but also down into uh, well into central New South Wales and southern New South Wales as well. Um, you now, if you've got, a, if you've got a, a, a place where you can muster sheep quite easily and you don't mind mustering them once every three weeks to do a, a Barbavax vaccine, it has been very effective and um, particularly in those places where they have very um, bad resistance, most of the common um, drenches, it's been a bit of a godsend. So um, if, if that is your situation, then Barbavax is definitely worth considering. The other thing about um, continually monitoring um, worm egg counts and treating sheep as, um, as appropriate, I can't, couldn't agree more. I think that's, uh, that's probably the fallback position for most producers. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Now, uh, Bruce, I'm going to throw this question your way. Um, Cameron uh, from uh, Pleasant Hills asks uh, a, two questions here. Uh, firstly, what vaccinations would you recommend if your lambs are spending a long period in a feedlot? Uh, I've heard recently that you should give five and one to lambs in a feedlot every six weeks or even after the first two doses, um, is there truth in this? Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Can I just add to the Barbavax, which I didn't talk about? Um, well, there's a, an excellent review of, of um, when it's useful to use Barbavax and when it may not be useful on the Parabos website. Um, so it is 60 cents a dose. Um, and it does depend on exactly your situation as whether it's going to be useful. But as Matt said, there are, there are people who have found it extremely useful. It doesn't mean that everyone will find it uh, is what they need. Okay, um, sorry I got distracted there. Um, so, sorry David, just uh, refresh me on the, the question. No worries, Bruce. Cameron asks, uh, what vaccines do you recommend for lambs and feedlots? Uh, he's heard yeah, recently... Feedlots. 
Yeah, he's heard recently that you should give yeah. five and one and lambs to uh, in feedlots every six weeks. Uh, is there any truth okay. in this? Is there any truth? There's part, well, part truth. Usually what, when you hear things, there's always part truth. The uh, five-in-one or six-in-one vaccine, the Achilles heel for that vaccine appears to be pulpy kidney. Um, so as we know, something like tetanus, uh, two doses, is going to last a very long time. With pulpy kidney, um, the five-in-one and six-in-one may only last up to three months. So in a feedlot, I would be certainly considering um, reboosting with, um, if they've had two shots of six in one, reboosting with five in one um, every three months, um, probably not down to six weeks. TASVAC 8 does claim to have a 12 month protection period for pulpy kidney, um, but I'm not aware. Matt might have better information for me. I don't know. Uh, exactly what that's based on, but that would be a consideration in a feedlot is to give them two six in one when you get in there and then maybe boost with the uh, Tazvax. In fact, you'd have to give two doses of Tazvax um, to get that longer protection. So one of those um, initial doses would have to be Tazvax. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, Matt, I think this question suited to you. Um, Don asks, uh, how important is the timing of the second vaccine? Um, they do their first vaccine at landmarking and at present uh, they do the second vaccine at weaning, which can be up to three, ma three months after the landmarking um, back, uh, first vaccine. Yeah, I ideally the label uh, the label and also the trial work that the label's based on um, recommend four to six weeks. But uh, in practical terms, most people are doing what you're doing, Don, and vaccinating at landmarking and then again at weaning. So um, you probably just need to uh, monitor the results. You know, are you getting any losses in between marking and weaning? And um, if you are, um, if you're going well with that program, then um, continue on. Just bear in mind, you are you are sort of um, working a little bit outside the manufacturer's recommendations, and there may be uh, a benefit in mustering those lambs early and um, vac revaccinating them before weaning if you are seeing losses in between marking and weaning. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, Matt, this question might be suited to you as well. Uh, Chris asks, uh, is any of this information relevant to goats? Yes, look, most of it is. Um, goats suffer from um, the same range of diseases as um, sheep and um, most of the vaccines, or a lot of the vaccines, the, the, the fundamental um, vaccines are registered for goats as well. So if you look on the label, you'll see what the um, differences are in recommendations between sheep and goats. A good example is with cheesy gland where goats um, seem to get um, fairly uh, um, hard hit by cheesy gland and they require more frequent boosters. So that's uh, that's one obvious difference. But um, the other thing is they, they tend not to get as many um, cases of um, black leg as sheep, but you know, the black leg vaccine is um, included in the five in one and six in one anyway. So if you're going to be treating goats for clostridial diseases, for uh, tetanus and pulpy kidney, then they're, they're included. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Bruce, um, just wanted to let you know that we can see your screen there still. Um, do you... There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, look, Matt, I think... Um, oh, there's a big picture of Matt. There you go. Um, Matt, I think this question is also suited to you. Um, should the scabby mouth vaccine be applied on the front leg on lambs at marking if mulesing to avoid disinfectants used on the mulesing shears? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it, is a, it is a living virus vaccine and any disinfectant will inactivate it. So putting it on the inside of the front leg in that armpit area is a, uh, is, a, is a good place to do it. The only stipulation is it must be done on bare skin and so in that, um, in that you know, uh, place in the, in the armpit or the, the back leg um, where there's no hair or wool, 
um, they're, the, they're the appropriate places. Don't be tempted to put it onto the cheek or on the ear or any other place um, where you know sheep are going to rub it and they're going to spread it in places where um, it could cause um, nasty lesions. So yes, definitely put it on the inside of the front leg. Just while we're talking about scabby mouth, it is one vaccine that you can actually check to see if it has um, been effective. So if you um, uh, bring the lambs in about 10 to 14 days after a scabby mouth um, vaccination, after you've scratched them, then you can actually see a little row of pustules that turn into little scabs in the, in the exact area where you've scratched them. So that's a, a great uh, way of auditing your own um, vaccinations to make sure that those uh, vaccinations have been effective. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Um, now, Matt, I think this question here is also uh, uh, good, uh, suitable for you. How do you know if you should use Campivac? Is there any tests? Yep, um, there definitely is a test. It's a blood test. And you can, if you suspect that you've had um, losses, for example, in between um, scanning and um, lamb marking, then um, you can ask your vet to um, take blood tests and submit them. And there's a, a test that's been available since uh, 2014 in Australia, and it measures the antibodies. So it measures the exposure of the ewes to the Campylobacter bacteria. Now that'll give you a pretty fair indication as to whether the use of A, been totally unexposed, they've never been exposed to it, B, they've had a small exposure but it's probably just you know in the background, or C, they've had nasty recent exposure that could possibly have caused um, abortions and uh, pregnancy losses. So I'd, I'd encourage anyone who is in that situation to um, request their vet to uh, to do blood tests and submit them for antibody testing. Perfect, thank you, Matt. Uh, Bruce, I was wondering whether the, this question may be uh, suitable for you. Bruce, Rosie asks, how do you find out what sort of arthritis is in your sheep so that so that you know whether to vaccinate or not? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Rosie. Um, look, the only uh, the simplest way is to um, uh, get somebody to carry out uh, postmortems on uh, several of the sheep, and then um, get bacterial bacteriological examination of the joints um, and find out what the cause is. There aren't reliable blood tests um, that can be used, so it's it's quite a it's actually a nuisance. Um, but that's the only simple way of doing it. Um, David, I was also just going to, um, I hope, hopefully I've answered that, I was going to just comment on something Matt said that was um, very important about the, um, the the question, which I think is very common and I possibly didn't explain well enough in the webinar, um, the question about that, um, the first dose given at marking and the uh, second dose at weaning. The important thing about the first dose is that it's a sensitising dose and the second dose can be given any time after that um, and uh, will, so long as it's after three to four weeks, it will be a booster dose. So you can wait uh, one to two months, three months, and you'll still get a booster dose. But while uh, once the period, um, once you've got outside the three to four weeks um, and you haven't given the booster dose, your animals are at risk until um, you give that booster dose. So that's why on the packet it's recommended that you give it three to four weeks apart because it gives the maximum chance of your animals being protected from when you start your vaccination program. But the sheep's memory, the immune memory, will still be there from the first vaccination. So if something goes wrong and you can't vaccinate them, you're only leaving yourself at risk for that period you're still going to have an effective second vaccination. And that's what Matt was um, saying in terms of the um, uh, monitor your losses, because if you're getting losses, then you need to bring it forward. But generally, people get losses with things like pulpy kidney actually right around landmarking time. And, and actually, yarning sheep can sometimes stop an outbreak of pulpy kidney, surprisingly. 
Um, and then again, when you get that change of feed around uh, weaning time and people start to um, boost the, the lambs, particularly prime lambs, is when you can get the other problems with um, pulpy kidney, for example, whacking lambs on, on a loosened paddock. Perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce, that answers our next question too. Uh, George asked, is the time between marking and weaning uh, too long for vaccination? Now, George, I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, Bruce, this question will be suited to you as well. Uh, Brad asks, if ewes are joined twice in a, in a uh, twice in 12 to 13 month period, should they be vaccinated twice, i.e., four weeks prior to lambing? Um, the the um, pre-lamb vaccination, if you're wanting to get effective uh, um, uh, antibody levels in the colostrum, my understanding is that if ewes have been vaccinated anywhere up to six months prior to lambing, um, that you should get effective uh, levels. Remembering that what appears in the colostrum mimics the antibody levels in the mother, and it's not as though by taking those antibodies out in the colostrum that you lose the antibodies in the mother. The mother still has it. Um, so I would suspect that you'll get away uh, very adequately with just giving one vaccination, but Matt might like to comment further. I think he'd have better information than me on that. Matt, do you have any additional information on yeah, that? Yeah, not a lot. No, not a lot to add. There is definitely a response to the, uh, the vaccination closer to lambing. But as you say, Bruce, the, the um, four to six week period prior to lambing is not uh, not a critical time. And for a situation where you are joining, um, you know, uh, three times in two years or, or twice in a year, then, um, you know, there's no need to over vaccinate those sheep. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> now, Matt, uh, this next question is for you. Oh, and Bruce and Matt together, just uh, to, just to let you know, we have a we've been absolutely swamped in really good questions here. I'm looking down my list. We've got another 15 questions, and they're all uh, very insightful. So just to gauge, you know, how we're how we're tracking with regards to this Q and A session. Uh, as I said at the start of the webinar, everyone, Matt is the director of Door Butts, um, an animal health organisation operating operating out of Southwest Sydney, uh, but He's also representing Zoetis this evening as the key advisor to their veterinary operations team. This question here to be suitable for you, Matt. Matt, uh, this is a technical one with regards to 6 and 1 and 5 and 1. Uh, if you have 6 and 1 on hand, can you use it on cattle instead of 5 and 1? Yeah, now this is a this is interesting because cattle don't actually get cheesy gland and that's the antigen that's in... Um, that's, that's added to five in one to get six in one. And so it, it's not even registered for cattle. Um, the other thing is the dose is different. Cattle generally get a, you know, a two mil dose of, uh, of five in one or a larger dose, um, depending on the, the type of vaccine you're using, simply because they have a lot more immune cells and need a, a bigger stimulation. So as a rule, I'd have to say you go with a label and say no, and um, borrow some, uh, borrow some, you know, um, five in one or seven in one um, if you're doing them for lepto as well from a neighbour who's got a lot of cattle, rather than doing them with a sheep vaccine. Perfect, thanks, Matt. Now, Matt, this is probably uh, just touching on what Bruce was talking about with the uh, pulpy kidney um, uh, vac uh, vaccination. Uh, Ruth asks, uh, I've been told the pulpy kidney vaccine only remains effective for three months, yet the label says uh, annual boosters are sufficient. Um, any, uh, any explanation for this? Yeah, look, Bruce did um, address this in his talk. Pulpy kidney, more than any other vaccine, is very responsive to the, um, the amount of challenge that you're getting. And when when um, sheep and, for that matter, cattle or goats have um, changes in feed, uh, particularly when they go from dry feed to lush feed or from, um, you know, sort of dry pasture into a feedlot situation, then they're given a massive challenge, a really big challenge. In fact, the challenge can extend the entire length of their intestine. And when you think of the surface area available for bacteria to multiply in the, in the lumen of the intestine, then there's 
potentially, you know, um, billions and billions of uh, units of toxin um, going to be absorbed, and it does um, overwhelm um, uh, animals that are even recently vaccinated. So that's why the timing of the vaccine is probably more critical than the duration of um, efficacy. It's impossible to say exactly how long the vaccine will last when, with regards to enterotoxemia or pulpy kidney. So um, if, you, if you are anticipating a change in feed, for example, if you've just bought sheep and you're going to put them into um, you know, lush feed, that is a, that's the appropriate time to give them a vaccination, no matter when they were vaccinated previously. And uh, you know, it, it does actually say on the label of some of the vaccines that they should be um, boosted before the time of challenge rather than uh, expect them to wait an entire year. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. That makes a lot of sense. Now, um, Bruce, uh, this question is asked specifically of you uh, by Brian. Brian asks, uh, Bruce, what's your opinion on reusing a five-in-one packet that's been kept in the fridge for this second vaccine? Is it still effective if properly looked after? I, I'm not quite sure why this question's for me. We've got the technical person on this. I mean, I, it's it's very difficult at a webinar that's going to lots of people to say anything that's not on the label of the packet. So so I, I certainly wouldn't be be suggesting. Uh, I think the label of the packet says um, you know discard after thirty days for most of them. Um, what I do um, on my farm, which is not what I'm recommending anyone else do, does, but I, I don't take the I don't disconnect the unused half unused packet from the. Um, the gun, I leave it all connected and it goes straight back in the fridge um, and then I reuse that uh, when I next need to vaccinate. But I do make sure that the vaccine hasn't gone cloudy. It all depends on your um, uh, attention to hygiene. The risk is not that the vaccine won't work. The risk is that you'll give animals something that uh, you don't want to give them an infection. Um, and so you do need to be very careful. I. I see most people who vaccinate, and I have contractors come onto my place from time to time, um, people leave the same tube on and move tube from tube to tube instead of using the new tubes. Um, I know it's a nuisance, but I always change the tubes um, with each packet. Uh, I don't end up with um, 500 spare tubes in the rubbish bin um, that haven't been used. So there's little things there. So I'm reticent to say anything that's, that's off the packet. Um, the risk of storing vaccines is simply that they um, have it, that you've got some sort of, of contamination and even though they're stored in a fridge, a fridge doesn't prevent contamination, it just minimises its build-up. So if you leave that vaccine for long enough, there will be build-up there. So you do have to be fairly careful if you are reusing vaccine. But I'm sure Matt would love to correct me on any of those issues. Matt, any rebuttal? <laughs> Well, I, I think you've nailed it, um, Bruce. The, it's very tempting to uh, to just keep on using um, vaccine. The, the labels, you know, tell you very clearly what what you um, what you know what you need to do. If there is contamination, or if you do get a reaction, that's the first thing that the vaccine company is going to going to check. You know, has has there been a reason why there's been an adverse reaction? And um, you know, I think you've you've outlined the risks there in uh, in reusing vaccine that's um, just been popped in the fridge. Perfect, thanks, Matt. Um, now, Bruce, I think this next question may be suitable for you. Um, Simon asks, I have to vaccinate my stud lambs with Gidea, Scabigard, Erivac, and Six and One. How would you suggest to space the vaccinations out? so not to overload the lambs system? Yeah, look, that, that is a great question. And this overloading the, 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 the lambs immune system is a really, really interesting question um, because um, my background is very much um, in specifically with foot rot and with foot rot vaccines. And that's one case where we appear to overload the system. But my wife also undertook a vaccination program, um, a training for people, 
And in, in that uh, information, it said that we can cope with up to, I think it was 4,000 different um, antigens at any one time and still respond to them. So, so this issue of overload of antigens is um, certainly complex. Um, the, uh, my, my view is that uh, you handle the animals as less um, as you, you can and I'd be giving those vaccines together and I wouldn't be concerned about um, competition between those. I would certainly be giving them in the loose skin um, near the neck, except obviously the scabby mouth, um, but I'd do it on different sides um, for the Gadare versus the Erivac and the 5-in-1. Uh, but um, Matt's probably got more experience um, than me on that, but that's my understanding of antigenic competition. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Bruce. Now. I'll just move on, I think, with the questions. We've got a fair few here. Um, oh, Dave, can I, just, can I just make one comment there? Um, Bruce suggested um, the Erivac and the 6-in-1. You can put them together in the dual vaccinator and that'll actually save you a lot of um, time and trouble as well. Rather than having to do them as separate injections, you can run them both through the one vaccinator. So if you go into your local store, you should be able to buy one of these new dual vaccinators to do that. Um, thank you very much, Matt. Now, Matt, just quickly, I've had a question here from uh, from one of the attendees tonight asking about the um, uh, the spelling of that question. Oh, sorry, the spelling of that website for uh, researching the vaccinations. Could you just read that out to me, and I'll I'll write it onto a word document here and put it on the screen for everyone. Yep, it's P U B. Yep. C R I S Pub Chris. C R I S. Right, yeah, no worries. Well, I'll yep. I'll just chuck that up on the screen there for everyone to to see. Um, is it just one word? Yeah, just one word. And so, if you put that into your search engine, the uh, the first term that comes up will be um, the APVMA site. And APVMA is is your regulator. That uh, that's it. The um, the uh, it's, you know the federal government authority that actually um, looks after all of the vaccines and other animal health um, products that are used in our in our livestock and for our uh, for our pets and horses uh, for that matter. And so the APVMA runs a um, a special website for the public, and that's called PubChris, and they've got all of the labels there. Every, every label of every registered product. Perfect. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, now, moving on with the question here, let me just have a look. Um, Bruce, there's a specific question for you coming from Simon. Bruce, is there any weight in vaccinating ewes four to six weeks out from lambing with two mil of six and one instead of one mil to limit mastitis? Uh, sorry, is that vaccinating with a six in one? Um, the, my, my understanding is that there's no vaccine available that will have any effect on mastitis. The only value, there's no value in giving um, two mils of the vaccine. Um, it's registered to give us one mil to sheep. And surprisingly, um, which my little mind doesn't understand, it's not related to weight or anything. It's just uh, stimulating the immune system. Um, and um, there's, I, I don't quite understand the question, but I can't see any value at all in it. Um, I might, might throw that back to Matt in case he knows. I just, David, I know that this isn't the question. Just to, for the listeners, um, the PubChris site, it, it stands for Public Chemical Registration Information System. So it's just shortened. The, the pub is nothing to do with going to the pub. It's for Public Chemical Registration Information System. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I'll I'll put that up there now. Matt, do do you, any any truth in the uh, six and one two mil of six and one limiting mastitis? No, uh, Simon. You can happily put that one up on the uh, the MythBusters board and say busted. So you've uh, that that's um, not a thing. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Matt. So um, good answer there for you, Simon. Now, Ruth, I hope we've answered your question about keeping the open pack in the fridge for the next use uh, some months later. Uh, now, uh, Matt, I'll throw this one to you. 
Megan asks, is there any vaccination, known vaccination for pneumonia? Yeah, um, there are overseas uh, vaccinations in New Zealand. They've got one that's registered for um, improving um, the weight gain of lambs uh, when they're subject to um, pneumonia and it's directed against the bacteria that causes pneumonia Mannheimia hemolytica. Um, not available in Australia for sheep, but it seems like there has been a lot of interest in it. And so um, that may be an area for more research. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Bruce, have I got this right? Public chemical registration system? Yeah, information system. Ah, yep, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. No worries. Um, yep. Okay. Now, um, and just just to just to enter that, there are quite a few extra vaccines they have over in New Zealand that we don't have available here. Um, and the I guess that just re-emphasises a point. Why do they have more over in New Zealand? Um, and it's not because they're smarter or better, but they're running their sheep under a much higher challenge in their system with the higher rainfall and the higher stocking rates, and that's when you're going to get your most challenge. And I said in my presentation, Matt reinforced it, but it's all about vaccination, is all about thinking about what system your sheep are in and what the challenge is going to be. Um, and not just saying, oh, they'll be right, but saying, okay, they're under a challenge now, the vaccine's cheap, um, I, they really should be vaccinated. Um, rather than ending up calling Matt or myself when the problems happen, saying, can you come and tell me why my sheep have died? So just that, that's just a reminder of, of the, the extra challenge that the Kiwis have, which is why they've been under more pressure to develop more vaccines. Perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, any bit of context helps in our understanding of these things. Matt, a question specifically for you from James. Matt, should I use Gidea, which is unopened, in date, but has evolved a black residue inside. It has always been kept cool slash refrigerated. Uh, no, James, you shouldn't um, shouldn't use that good air. You can return that to uh, where you bought it and uh, get them to exchange it for some um, some that that aren't affected. Um, it you know everything sounds like it's um, it's been handled properly. But if there is a residue, if it looks funny, then um, the um, that's that's a good early warning sign to you that it, you know something may not be right. So don't take the the risk with it. Good air is a is a very important vaccine. If it doesn't work, then um, you know you are you are at risk of losses. And so bring it back to where you bought it, and they'll exchange it um, you know through your uh, through your store. Perfect. Well, thank you, Matt. Matt, I think the next question, we may have already dealt with this, so uh, you, I'll let you be the judge of how long you want to spend answering it, but how, uh, Dave asks, how important are the guidelines regarding usage after opening a vaccine, such as 6 and 1, are they still effective after 24 hours? Um, yeah, well, Bruce has, Bruce has given us a, a fairly good run-through on that one. Um, some some um, vaccines um, say that they must be used within 24 hours, and so I'm not going to argue against that. That's a that's a label guideline, and that's a legal document, and so um, you're sort of bound by law if you if you purchased it and as a user, um, you know, to uh, to follow those guidelines. And if you if you don't, you know, I'm not saying that a disaster is going to happen, but it's sort of at your own risk. Other vaccines. Um, are okay to use within 30 days of first opening them. So, you know, you can you can pick and choose which one you think is most appropriate for uh, for your place. Thanks, Matt. Bruce, uh, this is a, a an involved question. Uh, Bruce, we have only ever given five and one, and more recently six and one, along with Scabby Guard and Gidea for breeding use. We have only ever had one verified death for pulpy kidney. Have we just been lucky or is there likely to be other factors in having minimal losses despite not giving up, not giving a follow-up vaccine, uh, vaccine? Yeah, it's, um, so was there a, it sounds as though the risk from pulpy kidney is relatively low because certainly with pulpy kidney, 
a single vaccine is not going to give you protection, but the ewes will get protection once they're given their, their it sounds as though they're being vaccinated once a year, but the first, do, the lambs are only getting one dose. Is that, that correct? I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. David didn't uh, clarify there, but I suspect there are. Well, I, 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 a, a quite a common practice is for producers to give a five in one or six in one at lamb marking, and then depending on what happens, uh, often lambs don't receive the one at weaning time. Um, the issue is that from that point onwards they're susceptible to any of the clostridial problems. Now, you're unlikely to get tetanus, um, particularly depending where you are in high rainfall areas. Um, you're, if you don't have a liver fluke, you're not going to get black disease. So the, there's a few things there, but in terms of pulpy kidney, either the lambs aren't being pushed very well, or for some reason they're resilient, or there's not much challenge. But we would normally see um, uh, problems with pulpy kidney uh, from time to time, and certainly over a 10-year period, most producers would experience it uh, in certain seasons. So I'm guessing you might be lucky. The other comment I'd make, um, and we've skirted around this, um, and it's difficult to know because I definitely don't have the information, but TASVAX does claim to have a much longer protection period for pulpy kidney. This is separate to the question. Um, the frustration I have with TASVAX is that um, it, do, it doesn't uh, add in the um, cheesy gland. And we've gone to all this, this trouble now to have a relatively free uh, cheesy gland dose when we use six in one versus five in one. Um, and um, the industry, not individual producers, but the industry benefits if we have less trimming. Everyone benefits if we're not losing it. So it makes sense to have it. It's just disappointing that we get an eight in one and they didn't make it a nine in one. There's my rant for the evening. Matt's busted the myths and I've had my rant, so we're all happy now. <laughs> Perfect, Rodeo, thank you. Now, Charles asked the question of both Bruce and Matt, uh, but Bruce, as the, um, as the owner of the subject area, cost effectiveness of vaccines. I think this is suited for you. Now, Charles is up um, in towards the, um, the lower part of the uh, southern tablelands, north of Yass, uh, uh, north of, yes, north of Yass. Now, Charles asks, uh, what is your view on the cost benefit of using 6-1 vaccine with vitamin B12 for the first two vaccinations for lambs? Oh, look, um it's very difficult for me to say uh, for without knowing the area. My my view is, and I've I've actually done a webinar on this, which David knows, is that in in many many cases, um, adding in the extra um, things that come in the the vaccines, apart from the vaccines themselves, are not often beneficial. Um, vitamin uh, B12 is very useful if you're in sandy coastal areas where B12 is a problem, particularly in parts of Gippsland and southern Australia. Um, I'm not aware that B12 is a problem in your area. If you are committed to using it and you think it's beneficial, um, I would encourage you at some point to um, um, weigh and leave 50 lambs un, uh, just vaccinated with six in one rather than the, or, or 100 lambs, whatever you've got to do to get a pack, um, and just see whether it has effect. If, if you are deficient in B12, it's a spectacular um, outcome by adding B12. If you're not deficient, it's a complete waste and all it does is go out in your urine and you've paid extra for it. Um, and it is a, a reasonable amount um, extra. Um, if you don't have the deficiency. The other point that I, I do get annoyed with is selenium, which is added to a lot of vaccines. Um, the, I think I've calculated there's enough selenium in the vaccine for an 11 kilogram lamb. Remembering that selenium has to be treated, um, has to be administered on a body weight basis, and vaccines don't. So if you have selenium deficiency and you're concerned about it, and you're vaccinating your lambs at lamb marking, adding selenium in is fine. By weaning time, there's insufficient selenium, and almost all the drenches these days have selenium in them, uh, which is a change, um, and so I'd be relying on that instead of the vaccine for selenium. Perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Quick question for you, Matt. Matt, uh, Brad asks, if our packers are running with a ewe flock, should they also be vaccinated with the same vaccines? 
i.e. in this instance gland vac. Yeah, so um, alpacas are subject to um, the same diseases and so there's a there's a risk there. The only problem is um, the vaccines haven't uh, haven't actually been tested on alpacas and they don't have alpacas on the label. But having said that, every, all the um, all the alpaca vets uh, tend to use um, cattle products first and then sheep products second for alpacas. So um, uh, yes, um, you know it's an off-label use is, is probably the the bottom line but it's a very common thing to do to vaccinate um, alpacas with the with the um, five and one vaccine. Thanks, Matt. Now, Patricia, Thanks, Matt. Patricia I think uh, Patricia asked, how long do you uh, do open vaccines, six and one, get air and scabby, last in the fridge with a tube clamp to keep the air out? Uh, I think we've been over this um, uh, before. Look, Patricia, I think the key thing is there to to, to read the label and uh, and abide by that. Now, a quick question for for Matt, I think. Now we have vaccinated at weaning. What is the best program for the young ewes going forward, bearing in mind their first lamb is 18 to 19 months away? And that's from Don. Are you able to answer that, Matt? Yeah, so the ideal time to vaccinate them between um, weaning and their first lambing is going to be um, you know, a short while before their first shearing. So if you vaccinate them um, prior to shearing, that'll give them an intermediate one and then they'll be ready for a, a booster, an annual booster, prior to lambing. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Glenn. Uh, Tilly asks, what do you think that the addition of B12 is cost effective? Uh, so Glenn, I think uh, I think we've answered that through Bruce's comments um, back to Charles's questions regarding B12. Uh, Jonathan asks, Rigadere, I have heard that vaccinating mature sheep that are infected with OJD can make the infection worse. Is this true, Bruce? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm not aware that, that that makes it worse. The point is it doesn't have any effect at all on them. Um, the only the only thing, it, Gadir um, is a, a quite a basic vaccine. Um, it's quite an old vaccine in terms of its, its um, type of vaccine. And it does have an effect on sheep so that they actually do lose weight um, over the three to four weeks post-vaccination. There's a slight weight loss. Anything that um, causes um, animals to be under stress uh, can be a trigger for yoni. So there, there's a bit of um, theory behind it that could support it, but I know of absolutely nothing to say to make them worse. But given that it's $2.25 a dose, um, you are wait, starting to waste quite a lot of money if you're giving it to infected sheep. Um, and if while I've got the microphone open, if I can just comment on the alpacas, um, the, the response Matt gave, which was spot on, um, was actually talking about vaccinating our packers. I suspect the question was, and I think this is a bit of a misunderstanding by um, people in general about vaccination, I suspect the question was, if I've got some unvaccinated animals in with my vaccinated animals, does that make the challenge higher or does it make it worse? And generally the answer is, is there is yes. Um, if there's a couple of animals missed, it doesn't make any difference. But if you've got a large proportion of the flock um, that are unvaccinated, then the vaccinated animals are actually under more challenge and the vaccine becomes less effective. In the case of alpacas, most producers, if they've got alpacas with sheep, have two or three weather alpacas running with them. Those weather alpacas are not going to be um, susceptible to most of the, the issues that we worry about with the young rapidly growing lambs or those sorts of things. So not vaccinating those weathers doesn't put the sheep at any more at risk. So it's necessary for the health of those alpacas, but it's not necessary for the health of the sheep that they're vaccinated. I hope that makes sense. That's perfect, Bruce. Thank you very much. Uh, Bruce, while you're, while you're online there, a uh, quick question here from Kevin. Kevin's up towards Cumbarumba. Uh, is there any research done on docking lamb's tails with a gas knife um, and arthritis? Um, not, not specifically. Um, there was 
there was certainly about 10 or 15 years ago, there was concern that the a gas knife that wasn't hot enough left a more open wound that uh, where infection could get in. But I'm not aware of any work that indicates whether you've used a knife, rings or a hot knife um, in terms of arthritis. But it all makes sense that if hygiene isn't perfect or a wound is allowed to fester more than normal, um, then that would leave the animal more susceptible to infection. And what happens then when an animal gets general infection, sometimes that infection localises itself either in the leg joints or actually in the spinal cord and you can get um, um, effects of, uh, of either of those. Um, but my understanding is that most uh, people, particularly using the newer gas knives, um, it's a very efficient and effective way of taking the tail off. Bruce, this question here has been uh, specifically of you. Uh, how, hi Bruce, how important is the site of vaccination? In sheep we have been vaccinating long wool ewes after a pre-lambing crutch on the upper neck below where the jowl has been crutched off as it is reasonably hard to vaccinate a ewe in the appropriate area when she has long wool. Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt might like to correct me on this, but I've, I've got a real bee in my bonnet about actually where you vaccinate sheep. The, the vaccines we use are subcutaneous vaccinations. They need to go in where the loose skin is, and the two criteria is that you can uh, pull up the skin so it tents and you can put the needle in, and it's in an area of the sheep that if there is any reaction or slight contamination, it won't have any effect. So um, in the um, side of the cheek, I think is really inappropriate because if anything goes wrong, the most important thing for a sheep is eating. The second most important thing for a sheep is walking around um, after eating. And when I see people vaccinating, which is very convenient and they do a good job, but under the armpits, um, for six in one vaccinations, for example, under the armpits. Um, it really annoys me um, because um, if anything goes wrong, those animals will be lame. And I guess the reason it annoys me is I occasionally get called to outbreaks of problems which have been caused when there's been a problem with vaccination. And if they'd vaccinated anywhere else, the problem would have still occurred, but it wouldn't have affected the sheep. So um, I'm very much in, in the loose skin. Um, Phil Holmes once, no, I, I shouldn't give Phil Holmes his advice. He, he once said that if you were unsure about vaccinating, blunt the needle slightly and you'll feel it going through the skin for two or three sheep and you'll really know whether you're doing it properly. Um, but generally, I think it's pretty easy. Sheep mostly have pretty loose skin unless you're doing um, uh, pole dorset rams, um, uh, have pretty loose skin round the neck um, that you can vaccinate pretty easily in. Perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Now, Matt, do you, uh, just quickly, we've still got a few questions, but any um, qualification on, on site of vaccination? Yeah, just to, um, to add to Bruce's very, uh, very detailed answer, um, quarter inch needles. It's a lot easier to get the vaccine into the right place when you're using quarter inch needles, and particularly um, uh, when you're aiming for the, you know, the place high on the neck, um, just below the ear, where the loose skin is that uh, that Bruce mentioned, um, you can put the the vaccine gun at a 45 degree angle and um, get it in there. With the longer wool sheep, you may need to use a half inch needle and go in at 45 degrees. But recent research that's been done by uh, Tristan Jubb and um, uh, supported by Zoetis has looked at um, a lot of sheep injected, and the quarter inch needle does make a big difference. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Now, um, uh, Matt, this question will also be suited to you. Philip asks, if the ewe is vaccinated with a six of one pre-lambing, which is then passed to the newborn lamb and, and then is again vaccinated at marking, does this negate the need to do a second vaccination at weaning or earlier? Yeah, this is, this is a very interesting situation um, that you're describing here, Philip. So what the ewe is passing on to the lamb is actually antibodies. It's passing on protection through the antibodies. 
it's not actually passing on a vaccination. So the lamb still needs two doses of vaccine itself and the antibodies don't actually contribute to that lamb developing its own antibodies because they're, it's getting them passively from the ewe. Just the same as if you were bitten by a snake and you went to hospital and you got some snake antivenom, they would give you antibodies against the snake's venom. And um, that doesn't actually you know, cause you to make um, antibodies yourself. So the, in that situation, vaccinating the ewe gives the lamb protection, but it doesn't actually make it produce its own antibodies and you still need two doses of vaccine in the lamb. Perfect. Thank you very much, Matt. Now, um, Bruce, this question has been directed uh, directly at you. Dan asks, um, it is a bit off topic, but the cost effectiveness of trisulfonate lamb marking from an economic point of view, does it pay for itself? <laughs> uh, great, great question. Um, we, we did a, a, I did a trial uh, the year trisulfon came out and looked at the um, uh, looked at 1,300 lambs, 650 treated with trisulfan, 650 treated after, uh, weighed at marking time and weighed again at weaning time six weeks later. We looked at mortality rates and growth rates in lambs and we didn't find any difference. However, um, I think there's there's a couple of things and, and I did that trial work and I've used trisulfan ever since knowing that it's costing me something, I'm not necessarily getting my money back. But the, uh, the, one of the things I think is that um, until we've got um, sheep that are, are less susceptible, until we've got some sort of alternative and we don't want to put too much pressure on our chemicals, that while we're using mulesing, um, that it's a very efficient and cost effective way of controlling breed strike. Given that, anything that we do um, that minimises the risk of us losing mulesing um, is going to be highly beneficial. So I think the use of a, um, a, a pain reliever, and there are now three registered on the market, so there's trisulfan and two others that are available, um, is almost mandatory for sheep producers, um, even though it doesn't always um, benefit, um, uh, show you a, an economic benefit to the lamb for that treatment in terms of growth rate. The economic benefit is still being able to mules um, which itself pays for itself time and time again. So that's a roundabout way of giving that information out. And now I've made, might have made, that was not meant to be a political statement. <laughs> no, no worries, Bruce. That's fine. It's all good information. Um, now I'm just looking at the questions here, guys. They're starting to dry up and we've done a really good job. We've kept uh, over half the webinar attendees with us this evening. So well done there, keeping everyone engaged. And that's a, a sure sign telling sign of the relevance and um, uh, how well the questions have been answered. Now, a quick question here. Um, I suspect it would be best suited for Matt and his technical capacity. Uh, Matt Sandy asks, can you inject a 6 of one and selenium injection through a dual vaccination gun? Um, the dual vaccinator is only registered for using Erivac with uh, one of the Glanvac products. So you can get Glanvac with, um, uh, you know, selenium and uh, B12 in it. So if you're using that with Erivac, perfectly okay to use it. Now, I'll just, um, I don't, I don't want to um, split hairs here, but it is important to understand that the APVMA will only register um, things that have been tested. And the reason is because then you sort of know what the outcome's going to be. So they've, they've given the green light to, uh, to use Erivac and Glanvac together, but they haven't given the green light for anything else. And so if you're using um, something that's not registered to put through the dual vaccinator, then you're taking a big risk uh, yourself. And that, that you know, could lead to adverse events, you know, such as a um, an allergic reaction or goodness knows what else, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to um, beat that topic up, but it just means that they you know, the vaccines may not work or you may have an unintended consequence. Now that's particularly important when you look at something like um, Barbavax and you're tempted to put that through the dual vaccinator with another vaccine at the same time. And um, Barbavax works extremely well on its own. And I spoke with the manufacturers and they emphasise the fact that any change 
to the formulation of Barbavax will you know, affect its performance, its ability to protect the, the lambs. And so you don't want to mix it up with anything. So that's, that's probably a good example. And I, I really can't um, say anything about um, uh, selenium that's not included already in the vaccine. Okay, right now. Thank you, Matt. Perfect. Um, look, last question, and I, I suggest it's uh, suited to you, Bruce. Um, if you want to do the honours, uh, Maria has asked of you, uh, they've got a 20% affection uh, for cheesy gland in the abattoir surveillance. Um, they definitely start uh, with the 6 and 1 in lambs and young sheep. But the key part of the question is, has the horse bolted with old sheep or can we use 6 and 1 across the whole flock? Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Um, I suspect that if they're getting that higher rates, um, the horse has bolted and also the, um, the issue will be to do with penning sheep closely together. They might be treating off shears for lice or something like that where you're getting quite high um, infection rates. Um, if, they're, if they're consistently been getting high rates um, in sheep going to abattoirs, there will be no point in applying cheesy gland vaccination to the older sheep. Um, the, the only value is, as Matt was explaining, is getting the passive antibodies if they were getting cheesy gland exposed to the lambs prior to their two vaccinations. But generally we would say that lambs are at risk to cheesy gland um, once the, in their post weaning rather than in their pre weaning, it's not um, most lambs being weaned will have low rates of cheesy gland, um, and so uh, in terms of cost, um, the value would be in, in using cheesy gland from now onwards, or sorry, a six in one from now onwards um, in uh, at lambs um, each group group of lambs at marking and at weaning, and thereafter continue in those age groups that you've started at Marky and Weaning for their annual boosters to be six in one. Great. Thank you very much, Bruce. So Bruce and Matt, that wraps up the questions for this evening. Um, I'll take this opportunity to, to, to make the wrap on this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce, for providing an excellent um, and succinct uh, presentation and overview on the cost effectiveness of of a, a range of different sheep vaccines. Um, I think you did a great job of taking us through the key ones in the amount of time available and providing that, um, that key information for us to help make these decisions in our own uh, businesses context. Uh, Dr. Matt Playford, appreciate you very uh, appreciate you being able to attend tonight's session as a panelist and for providing some great um, answers to the technical questions. Uh, really consolidated the webinar and, and uh, you know, worked in well with Bruce's more um, system-based systems -based approach. And I must make mention of Zoetis. Um, uh, thank you very much to the Zoetis for sponsoring Matt's um, time here this evening. And as we mentioned before, Matt is the director of Doorbutts and is also a key uh, consultant to the Zoetis veterinary operations team. So, uh, Bruce, thank you. A pleasure, David. And as always, the questions have been terrific. So um, you certainly got um, very switched on people. Yes, they've been great questions. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will be in touch uh, soon with an update of when we will be running and what we'll be running with regards to our next webinars. Please keep an eye on your emails. I keep them short and sharp so you can just have a look at the first few lines and you know what's going on. Uh, thank you very much to the presenters and thank you very much to the audience this evening um, for supporting the webinars and continuing to express your, um, your, your views and co uh, comments and, and constructive criticisms in the survey feedback. Um, it helps us show MLA that we're doing, um, you know, we're doing the, doing the job and also helps us helps us guide our strategy around the delivery of these webinars. Thank you to the presenters on behalf of the audience and thank you to the funding providers AWI and MLA through the Making More From Sheep program. Uh, we'll be in touch soon and have a good night.